Perfect. All right. Done. Um, our agenda for today, we will start with a short intro, of course. Um, we will briefly touch on the history from LLMs to custom AI systems, present some general use cases, how you can apply this technology. And then we will also have a live demo with our own retrieval augmented generation platform. Um, if we have some time, we can dig into the history of our application, what we're planning to do with it, and some Q&A in the end. And that's it. So about myself, my name is Herb Kreitzmann. Uh, I'm a senior consultant at uh, Synroid Data Insights. I have a background in physics and econometrics, and I have been working with data since 2016. I'm joined today by my colleague, Son, so you can introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. My name is Son, uh, Son Tadim. Son is the first name. And I'm also a senior consultant at Summit Data Insights and um, have a background in neuroscience and computer science. And yeah, have been working with machine learning since before it was cool, I would say, uh, since 2012, 2013. And yeah, we'll tell you about a very specific use case, I would say, of machine learning, but that is very much in the public eye at the moment. All right, thank you. Uh, a few words about our company. Uh, we are data consultancy based in Munich. Uh, we do everything end-to-end uh, -end data um, from strategy and technology, so big data implementations, data science, uh, cloud projects, um, to hands-on applications. Um, we support our customers from idea to production and uh, typically develop tailored solutions um, exactly matching our clients' needs. And that should be it. Starting with our actual content, uh, attention is all you need. Um, some of you might have heard that, uh, uh, that term. It is the title of a paper published in 2017 uh, by Google researchers, and it describes a mechanism they call attention. Uh, it's a new way how machine learning models can learn from data. Um, this is also referred to as a transformer architecture, and it took the uh, natural language processing and also image processing world by storm. All modern language models are based on this paper and on this mechanism. So whether it be an open AI model or a Google large language model, all of them nowadays use this attention mechanism and the transform architecture. Um, it's not only limited to natural language processing, it also works fantastic in image processing. Uh, so that's just as a side note. So what are these language models capable of? Uh, we nowadays refer to them as fundamental models and they have some general knowledge. Fundamental means they are trained on specific data, but can perform tasks that exceed what they have been trained on. So typically large language models can follow instructions and then perform tasks that you assign to them. They are generative models. So um, they are able to generate new content, new texts, new images. Uh, this comes with a few caveats. Uh, of course, when they are trained, they consume large amount of data. Uh, and in the case of language models, of course, language data. This could be something like all of Wikipedia, web pages, you name it. They learn some knowledge from that and are able to recall some of that knowledge, but there's never a guarantee that it's actually true because in the end it's generated content and it's somewhat randomly generated or based on statistics, random, uh, tricky word to use here. Where did you get from there? Um, we want to have mods that are specialized and able to form, perform tasks that are specific to our domain and actually address the problems we face in our daily work, we face in our company. And this typically means these mods need to be somewhat adjusted to our use cases. One way to do this is model fine tuning, which means you provide a model more training data, but this is a very expensive process um, because you need to retrain these models. The costs of training a model like GPT-4 are 
at least a few hundred thousand, but up to a few million um, just in computation costs. So fine tuning them is still an expensive process. One architecture that started appearing in like 2020 is called retrieval augmented generation. And this is what we will focus on today. The idea is I have a language model that can perform general tasks that has a good understanding of natural language and um, understanding and performing tasks that I assign to it. And now I provided a custom knowledge base. This could be a database, this could be um, a folder with internal documents in the form of PDF, this could be web pages or just the internet. And this way I combine the language understanding of the model and the task understanding with specific knowledge that I can control. And this way I can also guarantee that the model uses the information I wanted to and doesn't pull information from some kind of training data that I have no knowledge and control over. This approach is very powerful and I would like to go into a few use cases where you can apply this. It's definitely not limited to the use cases I will present to you. So um, please use your imagination and also ask questions, of course. Um, if you want to, uh, if you have something in mind and want to check with us, if this is possible, um, but I will touch on a few. So, um, just to mention them, I will go into more detail soon. Um, you can use this for custom service chatbots, for employee training assistance, for smart corporate, uh, search that is also able to do some summary or ask specific questions, uh, marketing content generation or content generation in general. Um, you can use it to support your sales. That's just something we do internally. Um, you can use it as a technical support bot uh, that can help you perform everyday tasks. Um, for example, like maintenance, where there's a specific order of, um, of steps you need to take and uh, you might not remember them all the time. Uh, or for auditing. Um, typically, you would embed this in some kind of application. So this is another layer uh, we might touch on. Uh, it could be, could be a chat UI, it could be a mobile app. You can integrate this directly into a CRM system, for example, uh, or in the term, uh, in the case of content generation, it could be directly integrated into a data pipeline. Um, there's just a few basic functions that um, are shared among these use cases or that enable these use cases. Uh, one of them is a context search. Um, to provide the model with information, I need to find the relevant information first. So that's our context search. Um, you can do document comparison uh, or in general content comparison. That's another functionality and something that's really cool um, is AI queries. Uh, so what we mean with that is that we use natural language and let our language model translate this into actual database queries and then retrieve that data. So you don't need to know anything about SQL or any database uh, query languages. You can ask a natural language and this, uh, the model will do the, uh, the translation for you and pull that data. Um, of course, like with every application, there's a backend, um, some code module, some automation templates, so you can deploy that, um, some document processing, data processing, and the most important, uh, the data that is connected to it. So this is typically how we build up these use cases. Let's dig into some of them in more detail. So for example, the customer service chatbot. The challenge, uh, many of you probably know this, uh, custom service has to handle high volumes of inquiries. And it's important to provide a timely and accurate response to keep your customers happy. And uh, yeah, the benefits are if you can automate this or support your customer service uh, with this kind of solution, you can improve the efficiency, of course. You can reduce wait times. Um, you can enhance the accuracy because you have control over the information. You can always have the most up-to-date information in your database uh, without having to, uh, to train your, your employees on it or the customer service employees on the most recent changes. Um, you have the cost savings through automation. You can have a 24 seven support, of course, because the system can be up and running all the time and is very scalable uh, to handle peak times. Uh, in this case, if we look up on the left side, um, this could be a chat web UI, this could be a mobile app, uh, and it's mostly using the context search. 
Another example that I really like is employee training assistance. Uh, training employees either for onboarding or performing um, new tasks is time intensive. It typically blocks at least one additional resource um, that can't do productive work in the meantime. Um, the challenge is to ensure a consistent and up-to-date training for all employees and also addressing the diverse learning needs um, and knowledge gaps of the individuals that are trained. With this kind of solution, where you have all your training documents um, supported or uh, given to a chatbot or a training bot, you can address these challenges. Uh, you will have a more consistent and up-to-date training because you will always have the most recent training material. Uh, you can personalize the training experience. If an employee says, okay, I need to learn more about a specific task, you can tell the model to, and the model can then generate a training program just for you. Ask your ask your questions, also answer questions if you have specific ones. And this way you reach a personalized training experience. Uh, of course, you will have reduced um, training costs because you don't need to, another resource to train uh, to train the new employee, and you have immediate support and uh, launch reinforcement. Uh, we do have a question coming in. Uh, I would like to address this. Um, so typically, the question is um, regarding historical significance of data. Uh, how would a system like this handle it? Um, the answer is it has to be in control of whoever, or it's in control of whoever controls the database that provides or the data source for the model. So, of course, there needs to be someone that maintains it and makes this decision. Uh, if I have a training document, I should replace it. Um, what you can do is you provide meta information as well. So if you just start um, pushing more and more information into your training database, that it could be a case that you have like an old training document and the new training document for the same task. If you have the meta information, you can task the model to always just pull the latest information. Uh, that's one way to control it. Or ideally, you maintain a clean knowledge base. But this is the case for essentially all, um, all data projects. Maintaining a clean and up-to-date database is, is key to many of these applications. I hope this, uh, this answers the question. And maybe I can add like a few more words. Um, number one is, so out of the box, um, non, I mean, not most of the um, ChatGPT, Gemini, whatever, proprietary LLMs do not know what the current date is. However, um, obviously you can provide this information via an external internal system and um, it can very much handle, let's call it date comparison. This is pretty easy for humans and just as easy for a machine as soon as long as it knows what is the current date. And if you tell it until which date something is valid, then it can compare easily. If it doesn't know it, um, we will see it later in the demo. I have not implemented this functionality of like knowing when and where it is in time and space. Uh, yeah, it will not be able to answer, obviously. Okay, yeah, in, in the case of you have two conflicting pieces of information um, and you provide the metadata when it was uploaded, for example, which is very easy to do, um, you can always task it to just take the most recent information they found about it. And also, this is where document comparison can come into play. When you have two conflicting documents, you can uh, you can start comparing them and ask this specific question. For example, how has a training um, or how has a, a specific task list changed over time? For example, for a maintenance application. Um, State Support Assistant is something we do internally. Um, we often have the case that we get a new project, it has some requirements, they are looking for someone with specific skills. And um, out of all consultants, um, not everyone knows exactly who is able to do what. But we have an internal application that uh, has access to all the CVs. So you can say, okay, for this project, 
who is the best fit, who has experience in these technologies, who has done something similar. And then the model is able to pull the data from our database and provide suggestions uh, which consultants could help best in this case. Um, of course, you can uh, take this a step further, also include some, uh, some database queries. For example, if you go out to a client, you need to sell something, you always want the most recent numbers. You might want to show, show some charts with the recent numbers. And um, if you have a database then uh, connected, you can just do this with a natural language and also answer questions of a client on the fly. Something involving the document comparison uh, is a use case that we stumbled across uh, with one of our clients. Um, they have a auditing process, but they often need to compare lengthy documents. Um, for example, um, they have main policies in the, their headquarters and the, um, the departments have some flexibility in applying these uh, policies. Of course, the auditing team needs to ensure that the flexibility is used within the lines they provide and within um, and still applies with the or yeah, is in line with the main uh, corporate policies. So they have this auditing tool now where they can ask specifically or for, where they can compare documents and in general ask where do they differ. And then they ask can ask specific questions regarding this comparison. And we will demonstrate a similar use case, I think, uh, soon. Since the, there are so many use cases related to this technology, um, we at Synvert built an, uh, what we call accelerator. Uh, it's a template uh, with a backend uh, with an one example UI. It has all the functionality implemented for the context search for the document comparison and the AI queries. And uh, this accelerator we can roll out really quickly um, for our clients, we can set up new instances within a few hours compared to building this from scratch over a few months. And we would like to demonstrate this now, um, how powerful it is, and also to give you a much better idea than what PowerPoint can do. With this, handing it over to you, Son. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, during the handover, I just started the other poll which was interesting to us um, basically about what, which of these use cases now that you've heard about most of them, which you are interested in. And in the meantime, let's see, here we go. I believe you should be seeing my screen now and hopefully seeing this tab in my browser. Confirmed. Perfect. All right. Um, so, I mean, I, I do see a few of my colleagues around. So, um, I'm guessing some of you have seen this screen before. And um, this is a web app. It's a pretty simple front end, which is um, used mainly to demonstrate the capabilities of our accelerator and um, we are going to be looking at three very specific functions which we've um, also referred to in the presentation the chatting on your documents which is the i would say pure retrieval augmented generation and there is a document comparison and the last one we call it ai queries or database chatting we are however you want to call it, it is basically transforming natural um, natural queries or natural language queries into um, SQL queries of some kind. So let me start by showing what kind of documents. So we have a lot of documents in here. The reason I put like random documents as well in here is to show that um, it's not that we have only one document and it's limited to this, but it's really, it's able to um, differentiate which document is relevant and uh, which is not. So let's see, uh, one document I put in here, actually two of these is for example, the terms of use from OpenAI. 
and uh, actually a question which came up quite recently um, is this one, who owns the content which is created by OpenAI? And um, yeah, to answer this, we simply ask. We do have the terms and um, we get an answer which is very much, I would say, self-explanatory and it has a citation which is very important to build trust. So now we look into this. Um, this PDF here is actually just a um, export of uh, OpenAI's um, terms of use page uh, saved as a PDF. And here we can see content. Um, yeah, okay. And uh, ownership of content. Ah, yeah. So here, this is where it got the information from. This is very relevant. The citation to know, okay, did it like as I, I'm sure many have heard hallucinations. So misinformation of um, in the data information, uh, making stuff up is. Uh, definitely an issue of LLMs in general because they are um, statistic. So, um, uh, that just came in. Um, what languages are possible? Uh, uh, you might to clear the chat and just ask the language, uh, the question in German again. Okay, so let's go in German. So, uh, um, we... right. Inhalt, okay, content, inhalt, whatever, but uh, let me just translate this like this. Uh, the, wait, what was the original question? I forgot. Who owns content which is created by, okay. So, uh, inhalt, der von open inhalt, generiert wurde. And as you can see, uh, German, it has absolutely no problem with. Um, it depends on the actual language model that you're using, but most of the large language models will handle, let's call it the big languages um, easily. So Spanish, French, English, German, Italian, I don't know, a lot of these. Uh, so um, I would say as far as I've heard, uh, Mandarin and Chinese uh, is, a bit like tricky um, because they are very special, but I would say all the Latin and Roman languages are basically you can use whatever you want. Um, yes. Okay. I uh, just one thing to add here: um, the context we provide is still in English, so the model is able to take the German question, somewhat internally translate it to English use the English context and answer back in German. But the, so there is no multilingual um, knowledge base. The knowledge base can be in probably any, um, I'm not sure if we tested this to have like different languages in the knowledge base, but still um, you don't need to provide all the languages in your knowledge base to, for the model to be able to, uh, to use them. It's just whatever the model learned uh, in terms of languages, it can use any context. Yeah. And um, we actually do, this is going to be part of the document comparison where we have a German and an English uh, document, which we will be comparing. And um, let me uh, go a bit further here. Um, so I was showing the citation and I would say very much interesting as a developer. So this whole thing is not something that works out of the box easily uh, it might it might not uh, depending on your documents on your um, on what you're trying to ask and if you have issues at some point you will probably have some if you're trying to upload some weird documents or have some weird data then you can really go into this and see okay so what exactly did it look for and what um, was the info that went into this. So as you can see down here, okay, so these, there's then some random uh, search results, but this is part of the retrieval and it's important um, to look at this if you find, okay, this is not the answer I was expecting. Um, yeah, maybe it's not because the large language model uh, messed up, but actually your search and retrieval messed up. 
So, um, yeah, this was one, I would say, um, like rather easy one step question. You look for the like uh, terms of use, content ownership. Um, pretty much this would probably be a, uh, you would be able to also do this with a normal search. Now, a bit um, differently, I also added a document from Wikihow, which is simply a very, very simple uh, first aid step by step uh, instructions. So I pretty much give a, um, let's call it a relevant situation. Uh, one person lying on the floor, he is not responding. What should I do? So, as uh, maybe some of you are first uh, aid responders, you probably know what to do. Um, and again, here, yeah, no problem. Also easy to find, like, okay, search keyword. But now um, it's getting a bit more interesting. So you have something like, okay, prepare for CPR. Um, and you're like, oh, my first aid course has been like, it's been some time since then. So you can keep on going and ask context specific um, questions. And yeah, you have these steps, check for blah, 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 positioning, chest compressions, uh, rescue breaths. Um, interestingly, WikiHow basically tells you to abandon people during COVID-19. But okay, um, it is what it is. Uh, <laughs> and so this is, I would say, a bit more interesting because you it, you might have, I think, a bit more complex instructions and um, relevant um, yeah, tutorials. And if they are multiple steps, then um, people get might get a bit like stuck and have to relook it up and they're like, oh, I don't know what to do now. And this is quite easy. So it's rather easy, if, especially if you have, in this case, you have it uh, available as like a step-to-step -step, um, instruction. You can just keep asking, tell it, okay, so uh, the person is now breathing again, what, what's next? And yeah, it knows how to basically keep going and keep going along this kind of step-by-step um, -step tutorial. So probably very relevant for also technical, um, let's say support or troubleshooting. Um, obviously at some point, um, you might run into issues if you have very, very complex ones um like very complex instructions where you need more than what is actually available in the information but then it gets i would say interesting because then is it a question of is it about the logic or more likely is it about adding this data somehow so adding some context adding some um, background knowledge that you as a person or as like a technician you might know but the system does not. All right. Um, so these, I think, are quite straightforward. Uh, retrieval, augmented generation, chatting on documents. So this is, I think, understandable if there are any questions. Um, so there's a question. Are the responses in your system censored? And is it possible to use the system offline? Um, uh, let me answer. This depends, obviously, on the large language model you're using. So the whole system is modular and um, you can swap out the large language model that you're using. Um, and depending on which one you're using, it's either censored, which is pretty much all of the proprietary ones, um, or not, which is, as far as I know, only the open source ones like Llama 3 by Meta. And is it possible to use the system offline? 
same answer it depends on which language model you're using or and the whole architecture so the one that we're using right now is based on azure so it's running in our azure cloud and it's using azure open ai which is pretty much open ai and um it is possible to um put this all into a on-prem um, system so you would need to do obviously a few more steps you would need to um, implement and deploy the search the storage or the orchestration the web app as uh, if it's offline it's i guess not a web app anymore but it's still running would still be running in the browser and the large language model you could also be serving from your offline on-prem server uh, and in that case you would like 99.9 percent .9 not use a proprietary one but instead you would be using probably some kind of open source one. I'm saying 99.9% because there is like a service for hosting stuff like this offline, but it's very niche. Um, all right. Uh, I think, I hope that answered the question. And if not, do follow up with questions. Um, and in the meantime, I would go to the next function, as we call it. Um, as you can also see, I'm not a big front-end developer, so this is not the best uh, interface that I've seen in my life, but it gets the job done. And now um, what we can do here is selecting documents, like specifically one here. This is comparing two documents, obviously you can like you could modify this whole UI to add more documents and have like a three-way comparison and so on. But usually you like, I mean, in, in any case, it's always like a one-on-one -on -one and then maybe you do another one-on-one -on -one and so on. So um, here we have two product brochures, uh, one from Bosch e-bikes and one from Yamaha e-bikes and uh i give it a topic to compare these two product brochures on and this is going to take a bit more time because in the background there's a lot of stuff going on so there's retrieval going on for both of these documents and then it's also trying to basically filter down already and then there's a comparison and yeah here we go um so we have a few differences probably and unmissing uh, missing stuff unclear things and um same as before this is i would say a bit of syntactic sugar about uh, around the uh, document chat but i think it's very interesting so this was also born out of a um, customer project we had where they were very interested in having these kinds of comparisons. So we see here, we have these, like this is also, I would say a very difficult kind of document to compare on because the information extraction here is very challenging. As you can see, it's very graphic. It's got like non-standard um, uh, compartments, but it still manages to do it quite fine, I believe. And the Yamaha one, similar. Um, also very graphic, also like text is all over the place. There's a lot of pictures and so on. Um, we are not, by the way, using the uh, newest, the uh, GPT-4.0, which would um, enable uh, visual input as well. Um, the question here is, did you create embeddings of the different documents beforehand and are using a vector store provided by Azure? Correct um yes to both so um we can however if you want to we can just test it out so um we uploaded these documents beforehand and part of the upload and pre-processing process that we implemented is uh, creating embeddings out of these and also um storing the embeddings and the text and so on in azure uh, specifically Azure AI Search, if you've heard of it. It's um, based on Lucene, Apache Lucene, 
um, very similar to Elasticsearch. I think Elasticsearch is something that uh, is a bit more well known. And yeah, but we can do this on the fly. If somebody is interested, um, we can simply like go to a web page, um, print it as a PDF, upload it. Depending on the web page, this is going to take like half a minute and um, start chatting on it. So this is very much an ad hoc um, feature capability here, um, which we implemented really because this is a demo and we want to be able to be like flexible and um, show things quickly. Uh, just a quick remark here. Um, this retrieval part, which includes the embeddings or some kind of vectorization, uh, so your or indexing, so your documents are searchable. This, of course, can be implemented using Azure or Azure services, but it's not limited to it. So if you say you want to build a pure on-premise solution, there are open source variants of this. Um, so you can build your local uh, document store that's also searchable. So all the parts um, of this uh, of this application, so the LLM is completely exchangeable to a local one or to any service provider you want to use. The document storage or your knowledge base can be on-premise or can be in the cloud. We just chose Azure because uh, this makes it flexible for us to also deploy a new instance of this application within like 20 minutes or so. Uh, so that's that's why we're using this for our accelerator. But if you're interested in um, a very specific solution or you have requirements that your data must not leave your service, there are, of course, solutions for this as well. Correct. And there's another question in the meantime, a, a technical question. Which techniques do you use to chunk these documents for efficient rack? Um, so it's mostly, I would say it depends a lot on what kind of data you want. And um, there is optimization um, like potential here. In our case, because we are mostly in this demo using um, PDFs and uploading documents, uh, what we do is actually an OCR, so um, optical character recognition. So what happens is uh, you have a PDF. So because PDFs are not like text files, um, it's not that easy to extract information and the text and the relevant layout easily. So that's why we use an OCR, which captures both the text, also the layout. So where is the text located? Where is the table located? Where does the table start? Where does it end? And yeah, hope that answers this question. And then in the meantime, what I put in here now for comparison is the current terms of use, which is the first document here, and the terms of use from OpenAI from 2023, uh, March 2023, to be, uh, to be very specific. And here you can see, all right, um, I wanted to ask it about the content ownership. In both documents, it's saying, yeah, the user retains ownership of the input and owns the output. And um, that's good. It's, I actually, if you look at this carefully, you see some like, ah, okay, it's a bit of a different wording. I'm not a lawyer, so I can't tell you if this is going to be like, in court, it would hold up to be like identical. But um, I do know that um, RAC in general is being used in um, legal context and uh, it is being evaluated. Um, I can't tell you how, how well it performs uh, at the moment, but I'm very, very sure that there's a high interest in that um, field. And yeah, you also see here then it f does find some differences. So it's very nice to compare versions of the same document, but these are actually not like super straightforward to compare because they don't have the same structure. So if we look at um, this, which is taking some time. All right, here we go. Um, so this is the, uh, oops, sorry. 
Great. Okay. That was a bit of a fail. I clicked on a link uh, by accident. Let me go back here. The good thing is it's uh, no wait. That's the terms of use here. It doesn't take too long, half a minute or something. And um, yeah, so I wanted to show you the different structures of the documents. Uh, we saw the current one, which is has been effective since February this year. And then the old one, which is from last year. Here we go. Um, by the way, um, one like tiny thing about consistency and reliability of what good. Um, it's actually um, very hard to um, very hard to almost impossible to make it like 100% reproducible. So what we see is if you ask the same question 100 times, you will get like 50 times the exact same answer, like word by word, character by character, if you set it up correctly. So you need to set a, it's called a seed. So certain parameters need to set the temperature to zero. I think a lot of people have heard about temperature, which is controlling randomness, but that's not really enough. There's other parameters, but even if you set everything up, like you will still see slight differences. Usually the, I would say overall message that you get back is going to be the same. If like, if you have, everything the same but the wording might change and uh, it does get like also you might have in 100 messages you might have three to five times uh, three completely different outputs suddenly like not completely different but different like content wise different just also to tell you that this is not a hundred percent but that's the same for humans which is interesting and it's still statistic Okay, let's see. Quick look at this, and then I think we need to move on to the last one, to the database capabilities. Um, this PF is loading very slowly. And, all right. For some reason, it does not want to load anymore, but um, yeah, I think we're good with the document comparison. Let's go here and just ignore. <laughs> um, ah, okay, I guess something crashed, which is interesting. What happened? It wouldn't be an authentic demo if everything would work right. Exactly. Very interesting. Um, okay, here we go. Yeah. Uh, all right, last one. Um, actually, let me first show you a bit. Um, so here in the last one, what we want to show is um, a connection to a database. So actually most, um, I would say productive use cases will include some kind of database and some kind of connection to a database. So this is also, this came out of a customer project and um, it's actually quite interesting. So now the question to me is, do you see this uh, ER diagram? No, okay, let me share. You need to share it specifically. Yes, let me share this very specifically. Um, this one, right? I do hope you see this ER diagram now. Yep. And um, just for demonstration purposes, I've um, created this, um, I, I basically downloaded this um, database, the data from here. This is a very well-known like toy database. Uh, it's called Chinook. And it's got some sales data, some media tracks data about some albums and um, so musicians and 
their tracks and albums. I don't want to go into too much detail of how exactly this looks, but this is overall uh, the view. It is not trivial. It's not like a huge database, but it's non-trivial. It's got foreign keys. It's got some uh, nice things. And uh, this is something we can work on because obviously we can't use any real data to show this here, but I didn't want to just like show nothing useful. So I go back to this one and um, yeah, so here now we can ask, so this database is connected to the system and obviously it's a SQL database. And um, for those of you who do not know SQL, it's going to be very difficult to get any data out of this. But even if you do know SQL, I believe it's going to be very difficult to match the speed of how fast we go from an actual question to uh, the SQL and the answer. So for example, um, the sales data there is, I believe, from 20, 2009 to 2013, and um, we have this question. Let's say you are a sales rep and um, you want to know this pretty hard. It's not going to be very straightforward to put this into a SQL query. And um, yeah, well, we get it quite easily. Um, interestingly here, is of course to also look at the actual query. So what do we have? We have a select. We first need to um, put the time and date of the invoice date into years and months. Then you have months because it was asked monthly basis. We sum it and uh, we also need to know where it actually came from. We also group by and we order by the month. And then we get this result. So actually quite nice, but yeah, this is also um, interesting if you keep going. So this is, I would say, it's not an easy SQL uh, query, but it's not like crazy wizardry, obviously. But if you now start also really wanting to drill in, and here we go also back to the question of time, here I'm asking first quarter of 2013. So it doesn't know what's the current time, but it does know, um, okay, first quarter of 2013 means between January and March. So um, of 2013. And now we have this customer with ID 56 who uh, paid yeah, 1584. Now, something uh, I would not recommend if it wasn't a toy database. Um, let's ask for first name and last name and address. So, Diego Gutierrez. Uh, yeah, as I said, it's fictive data, so no problem here. And we can really drill down even further. Let's say so um, we so this database always has support employees. Um, and uh, we can really drill in. Okay, so we have this Margaret Park. And yeah, so now we can talk to this Margaret Park, tell her, hey, you have a great customer. Maybe uh, you want to um like take special note of this guy and um, maybe also uh, send him a few personal messages, tell him, hey, we have new, I don't know, stuff available. And maybe we can also keep digging into whatever he's interested in. Um, all right. Let me see if there are any questions. Mm, I don't see any. And ah. so. This is the time where you can continue asking questions. Yes. Uh, can this system handle questions on the data lineage of, for example, Abinicio? Okay, that's a very specific question. Uh, 
<laughs> who is this person? <laughs> are they a colleague? Um, okay, so uh, it's actually, interestingly, we are working together with Abinicio um, and in the talks right now, uh, the answer is no, but uh, technically and from a conceptual point of view, yes, why not? But we don't have an integration at the moment, but we are working on it. And like we are working to get together on it with Abinicio. So this is, we, we are not just doing it on our own, like renegade style. Um, okay, then. Um, All right, shall we talk a little bit about the history of our application and what we're planning to do with it? In this case, I will share my screen again. All right. So we should be back to sharing my screen. Can you please confirm quickly? Yep. All right. So this, of course, didn't just appear out of nowhere. It was a very iterative process over time where we um took the learnings from our client projects uh, looked at uh our clients needs and look, looked at market development uh developments and yeah this is how we build this application so it started off with the enterprise search we did the data integration um i think we also did some sharepoint integration directly uh by now um automation big part um so this is where uh, our cloud and um engineering expertise shows um, the whole application can be, be deployed fully automatically on Azure. Um, we have the document comparison since January. Um, of course, did some hardening uh, bug fixes, uh, database analysis since March, um, different workspaces by now, um, performance tuning, optimization, and there's a lot to come. So what we plan for our accelerator is to include topics like governance, um, active directory integration. So you can have um, your company's um, logins, uh, you can have permissions on a user base. So maybe not everyone should be able to have access to all information. So you can integrate this directly um, and also govern the data like this. Um, we want to have flexible LLM providers. The structure allows it, but we haven't implemented for our accelerator yet. Um, AWS Badrock is one of the uh, platforms where we where you can have all kinds of uh, language models and of course locally hosted LLMs if you have um, computational infrastructure for that of course. Um, analytics and improvements. Um, one thing we'd like to have is of course a chat history um, so that users don't need to ask the same questions all the time. This also enables you as a provider of this application to do some analytics um, if you use this as a customer service chatbot, you can see what are your customers searching for? What are the uh, biggest challenges they face? And then you can either update your FHQs um, to avoid these inquiries in the future, or maybe just um, provide that information pro uh, more proactively. Of course, this also allows personalization. With that said, um, yeah, we still have a, a Q&A here. Um, what we would like to offer is if any one of you is interested in a personalized demo where you say, hey, I would really like to test this out on my documents. I have some PDFs of technical documentation or whatever, um, and I want to test this. Please reach out to us, and then we can schedule a demo um, for you and uh, start helping you with your, uh, your challenges. So... Four more questions, uh, four more minutes for questions. Otherwise, I thank you already for your attendance. Uh, it has been a pleasure. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to doing more of that in the future. Thanks a lot also from my side. <laughs>